Well, hello, 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 everyone, and welcome to the final round of this edition of RaceBot TV Friday Primetime. This is the VRS GT Sprint Series round number 12 at Le Mans. It's going to be coming at you in just a couple of moments' time. My name is Conry Maddock, and I'm joined by the ever wonderful Stefan Schlacker for the duration of this broadcast at perhaps one of the most famous French circuits, certainly the most famous endurance racing circuits here on the iRacing service. And uh, well, Stefan, uh, it's uh, we've always been looking forward to this point over the course of the season. Round number 12, last race, and what a strength of field we have here. If you don't know what the strength of field is, well, just saying the drivers are very quick. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, majorly quick, that is obviously. Jamie Fluke has once again uh, joined the ranks of many other uh, pro world championship drivers. And I mean, it is Le Mans, so it is kind of expected that these guys come out in forces uh, to enjoy what not only is the last round of the season, but most arguably the most popular track in European racing. And we still have our fan favorite with us. Yes, you saw it right. That is the Ford GT GT3. Yep, Kyle uh, Valero uh, is out there in a Ford GT GT3. He is the only one in the field that I can see so far. He's the Lamborghini of uh, Jamie Fluke. Of course, Lamborghini, popular choice uh, here at Le Mans, of course. Uh, so is the uh, BMW. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of as well. That isn't to say there aren't uh, other manufacturers getting themselves involved here in this one, or other drivers choosing those manufacturers. They've got a smattering of Audis a bit further down the field. And, uh, uh, well, I do not see Mercedes at all uh, from front to bottom. So that, that's unfortunate. It's, it's rarely that we get one Audi, but we do not get a single Mercedes. So um, there we go. But uh, for three minutes left in the session, of course, no one set the time just yet uh, here in this one. That's just how long it does take to try and get yourself around for a lap here uh, at the circuit to the stars but the lap times are now starting to come in there is jamie fluke in that uh, lamborghini for apex racing team heading his way through the final chicane monstering up over those curbs driving to the line it's uh, uh good to get a banker lap in here considering your limited opportunities to try and get yourself uh, actual lap times in there is the fastest lap provisionally being set by Jamie Fluke, but he is not the only sort of quote unquote top driver that we have in this field. We, of course, have uh, Gianni Vecchio a little bit further down the order. He hasn't got himself out there in terms of qualifying just yet. We have uh, a bit of a return to iRacing for Moritz Luchner at the moment from the uh, from the Dory Sports team. And uh, you've also got uh, Sven Hassers out there as well. And uh, Christopher Lollum, Gordon Mooch. It's it's uh, it's a bit of a star-studded lineup. It's uh, I think it's around about seven thousand strength of field. Would you say, Stefan? You might have the exact figure. I don't know. Uh, I, th I think it's actually closer to six point nine. I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure either. I haven't seen yet the SOF, so I can't give you an example there as well. But most definitely, it is sky high. Is uh, Sven Hasse heading his way across the line? Provisional up all position time for Hasse. And uh, that's about uh, two tenths of a second ahead of what Jamie Fluke's effort was. Uh, Andre Melchers came across the line for P4 there. Uh, as uh, we see, uh, here's another driver that many people will be aware of. That uh, is Jack Sedgwick heading his way through to start a lap here. And that's just a ride on board uh, with uh, Jack Sedgwick here. Just a little bit as he heads his way uh, through the first sector here at the circuit to the Saab, of course, largely about the straight line speed here at this circuit due to the, uh, the length of the Molsan straight. Um, but uh, there are some sections of this track where the car handling is so, so important, especially coming through this mid-sector. And of course, the high speed grip important through the Porsche curves towards the very end of the lap as well. Well, the BMW and the Lamborghini particularly going to move for those things. So that's why they are the popular choices there. Yeah, it, it is just that. I mean, that, that's also why we don't see the Mercedes. It's not fast in a straight line, and it plows through fast corners. So pretty much the worst combination you can have in a car when going to the track of Le Mans. So that's why we don't see a Mercedes here. And Jack Sadwick is going into the first uh, chicane here at the Uno Diaz straight. And obviously, this also means with just 50-odd seconds left on the clock, he's not going to make it around this track anymore to set that lap. 
yeah, uh, that is the uh, the situation with loan qualifying. If when time expires, you, you cannot complete the lap uh, that you are on. That's just the, that's just the nature of things. But it seems like we have 27 drivers set themselves times so far in this one. Uh, so interestingly enough, two pretty strong drivers, Jack Sedgwick and Gianni Vecchio, will have not been able to set times here in qualifying. So they'll have to start at the very, very back of the grid. So we'll keep track of the progress of both the 16 and the number one cars that now have to start at the very back of the grid. But uh, uh, for the moment, there are a couple of cars uh, still out there circling. There's uh, uh, Ulrika Kastorp there in, P, uh, uh, in the 15 car as uh, Kastorp yeah, well, he has to disappear and take the toe back to the pit lane because the session has ended. So we'll get ourselves over into the gridding procedure for today's race. This is what the grid's going to look at like then for the final round of the season here in the VRS GT Sprints uh, <laughs> GT Sprint Series. Sven Hasse P1 with Chris Lollam in P2. Jamie Fluke in P3. Govan Kuni P4. Gordon Butch in P5. Gabby Montoro in P6 to start. Andre Melter starts 7th with Ulas uh, Ozzy Durham in P8. Carl Valero P9. Bruno Spengler in P10. Uh, Eureka Kastorp. I, I wonder who could possibly be behind the wheel of that car. Um, yeah, some drivers like to use some alt accounts for these uh, official races sometimes. Elias uh, Rijka in P12. Marcus Nunez in P13 with Oscar Irina in P14 with Ian uh, Ganong Renault in P15. Pedro Berger in uh, P16 with uh, Soren uh, Kolodzhdi in P17. You've got Moritz Lone starting in P18 today. Um, Massie Malnek in P19 with Jacob uh, Masahuski in P20 with Florian Libigra in P21, Massimo Locatello P22. That's a bit weird to see Locatello starting that far back. I think it's, uh, well, just goes to show the strength of the field here today. Adam Volkovic in P23 with Dominika Chico in P. 24. Elliot Veyron starts in 25th with uh, uh, Maxence uh, Godino in P27. Yoni Tankman starts P20. Uh, well, Godino P26. Tankman P27. Vecchio P28 with no lap time set. Same with Jack Cedric. He'll start 29th. And Luke McEwen in P30 here for this final round of the season. Stefan, we got through it there with the names, uh, but uh, yeah, um, what a what a venue to have this final race of the season here of uh, Race Spot TV Friday primetime. Of course, we will go to a different official series for next season, but the VRS GT Sprint Series has certainly treated us well. Yeah, it has treated us extremely well. We have seen exciting racing, we have seen close battles, and we have also seen some, uh, yeah, uh, quite uncontested races as well. Just remembering back to Jamie Fluke and his extremely dominant performance, I think it was at Road Atlanta, if I remember correctly, uh, where he just stormed away from the field. Um, yeah, the, the GT Sprint Series most definitely has given us every single facet of GT racing, and yeah, it will be probably another Barnstormer here and Le Mans, especially with, by the way, Gael Valero being so high up the field. Ninth place for 4GT? That is incredible. You can see it weaving in and out on that uh, left-hand side as uh, we head our way through course uh, into the uh, the latter stages of the lap no point in doing a uh, full pace lap here at Le Mans will be here forever that's why we start relatively close to the end uh, of course uh, at uh, this uh, very moment uh, we've got ourselves uh, well strong drivers at the back <laughs> let's just say that Gianni Vecchio looking to try and work his way through the field uh, of course looking at further up the field uh, you'll get to see Sven Hasse. He's going to lead them to green in that uh, Lamborghini Huracan GT3 Evo. Lots of Lamborghinis at the very front of the field. There's the, uh, the BMW of Gordon Much that's sort of playing in amongst them at the very front of the field. And the Ford GT, let's see what it can do from, uh, from that position a couple of rows deep. But as we head our way uh, shortly towards the Ford Chicanes at the very end of the lap we'll get this race going of course if you're unfamiliar with the VRS GT Sprint Series then uh, well one scheduled stop is the order of the day um, usually happens around about midway through the race usually towards uh, usually drivers tend to push out 
that first stint as much as possible. You can see the front of the field, though, having to go single file uh, through the four chicanes here. That's because, well, two wide is a bit of a recipe for disaster sometimes, as we'll get things started here for the final round of the season in the VRS GT Sprint Series. Hassa leads them to green. Looks like everyone's okay uh, through the, uh, for the final chicane there to start the event. Sometimes that can cause issues uh, on starts such as this, but everyone threw in towards the first sector now. And, uh, well, we've got battling a little bit further back as well. Castorp, uh, I think, was able to try and battle with Bruno Spengler. He ends up ahead as they go single file through the first sector. Pretty clean start from everyone. Yeah, thankfully that is just because of the single file start that pretty much everybody did in this field and yeah pretty much the, the only move inside the top 10 that was exactly your cast of going past the canadian that is bruno spengler yeah, so uh coming up uh to the molsan for the first time uh, sven hasse has a two tenth of a second advantage at the very front of the field that will all be gobbled up as drivers all line up in the slipstream you'll see those cars actually take to the middle of the road because it is a public road it, so it does have camber um, sort of in the middle so it's a little bit higher in the middle so you, you want to uh, reduce the ride height basically to make sure you can get the maximum speed possible uh, by sort of straddling the, uh, the little peak in the middle uh, of the road where, uh, where the rain's meant to run off and down then towards the gutters. You see that in the real world as well and well exemplified in iRacing. Yeah, very much. So that is, by the way, a spe speciality of the French roads. They have the crest in the middle to keep the rainwater away from the middle of uh, the streets. So they always flow to the outside. And by the way, we already had our first major slowdown of the race. Peter Bürger uh, served a major slowdown. I think he is all the way down now to, what is that, 25th position, something like that, uh, from starting 16th. So he lost a whopping 10 positions just because of one slowdown uh, into Tetrouge. Yeah, the first lap slowdowns can be a very, very big issue, especially at a circuit where it prefers to use slowdowns rather than uh, rather than off-track sort of instant points. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's we usually either see one or two on the start of a race like this, and, uh, well, that has happened. So, um, you know, this, with, with the way the, the penalty for slowdown works, uh, basically works it out as an average through that little sector um, that you have done so in the past couple of laps but if it's on the first lap it has nothing to base it off so therefore it gives it the worst case scenario and you have to slow down a lot more than you would otherwise uh, after a good couple of laps but uh, you can see at the very front of the field has to still leading Lulum in no rush whatsoever to try and get himself through as with basically every single race so far this season Stefan it's going to be all the all about the fuel numbers well, maybe even more so here at uh, Le Mans due to the nature of the circuit. Yeah, draft trains are starting to happen. We also have the first rip in the field pretty much ready uh, because eighth place is pretty much the last car of this first train. Gael Valero, he hadn't had the best run through Indianapolis. Um, and uh, through Virage de Nage, so uh, he did drop a little bit behind. Not 100% surprised because that is the weak side of the 4GT GT3. Uh, maybe he can get himself back together uh, in this Porsche Corners, but it seems a little bit grim for him right now. Yes, he's closing in once again, but don't forget he has to hold that draft end. I don't see him really be able to do that in the next couple of laps. Uh, having a look to see progress from uh, out of position drivers. Uh, Gianni Vecchio attempting the not quite last the first challenge, but it might as well be. Um, he's up to P26 at the moment, so a couple of positions gained on the start on the first lap for Gianni Vecchio. What has happened to go back? Okay, slow down. Slow down penalty through the Forge of Canes at the very end of the lap. And oh, yeah, oh, I mean, you got to be careful about letting cars go, but yeah, uh, that's a pretty common place for it to happen. As well. Oh! Ugh, cast stop down the inside all of a sudden. Uh, Govan Kini using uh, or doing the slowdown, serving it on the racing line. That's never a good idea. Always is quite a spell for this size. Let's have a look where he did get it. Yeah, right here over the right side curb. That does hurt because that once again is a major slowdown for him. Not as big as you can get through that rouge, but still. You can see loses a lot of time, loses quite some positions, even back to 
Uh, Yuri can't stop at the very end. Nearly looked like he tried to box in the 4GT though. And there's the lunge from Kastov down the inside. Uh, but, uh, well, thankfully, no instant between those two drivers as we will return to the live pictures then. Uh, of course, 40-minute uh, event. We've got, uh, well, five minutes of that done already. Hassa leads from Lull and from Fluke from Much at the moment. Those are your top four cars, all kind of established in their trains at the moment. A little bit of separation between um, uh, between. Uh, third and fourth place at the moment as uh, drivers try to sort themselves out there. You'll notice that some drivers deciding that the bump drafting is also the way to go down the middle of the Mulsan as well. So um, it, this race is raced just that little bit differently compared to a lot of races that you'll see. We've seen another slowdown penalty for Good and Butch there. Um, yeah, the number four car, well, let a good couple of uh, drivers by there. Uh, there's Moritz Lohner in the 13 in the Lamborghini at the moment. Uh, the one thing you don't want to have happen is to be at the very front of the train. That's splitting from the rest of the cars ahead. So that's not an ideal situation. It seems to be the one that Moritz Lohner has uh, found himself in at the moment. Still feeling the very tail end of the slipstream to the 14 ahead. But uh, you've got to be in this leading pack to win it, basically. Yeah, you, have, you always have to be at the front end. You know, we're starting to see some splitter groups now as well in the front group. You have the first three, then the next three, and then once again, four, five, six cars. So these guys really do have to be careful now with all of these slowdowns coming in. They're ripping apart their own train. And not only will they throw themselves back, but it also will mean that they're not going to be able to get up to the position that they once were in, like Govangini, for example. Sixth place is now back into ninth place. and. He's not going to be able to get back into that sixth place if uh, that train continues to fall away from the three cars up ahead. For those mentioning, oh, why do we have so many default liveries? Why aren't you using trading paints? It's a race spot TV policy. We do not use trading paints. We use our own paint submission service. And the drivers just haven't submitted. That's, that's, that's all I can really say about that. You, you can say, you can tell the drivers, be more like Jamie Fluke. Jamie Fluke has submitted his paint. Be more like Jamie. Um, if you have a look at uh, Moritz Lohner, Moritz Lohner submitted his paint. Be more like Moritz. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, and especially it is kind of intriguing that some of these, especially pro drivers, didn't choose to upload their paints. I mean, they have some small obligations because they have sponsors on their car and what is Masievsky doing and that is not the racing track I think the 28 had a hard impact especially with some dust going over our screens let's take a look then at uh, what has happened to number 28 machine that's the Lamborghini of Jacob uh, uh, I have a feeling this is going to be at the entry of the S2 Karting. Uh, and these are always hard impacts. Oh no, it's right in the Porsche corner! Get spun around! Contact from behind as well. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at it. The uh, green Lamborghini uh, right behind the... Well, that was number Elliot Veyron. Yeah, Elliot Veyron number 13 Lambo. Oh! just too hot into the Porsche corner and then gets the first tip that unsettles the car of Masievski a little bit and Masievski overreacts on that slide and sends him right into Veyron again and then that second touch the uh, R8G sports driver can't do anything about and completely destroys the race of Jakob Masievski. Just a lazy incident, and it's, it's all on it's all on Elio Elio there. You, there's, there's almost a little bit of situation coming uh, through the Porsche curves there uh, afterwards as well. Uh, but yeah, that's unfortunate for the number 28 car. They had absolutely nothing to do with that. Uh, it's all about the car behind running over them into that very fast section. Coming up to 30 minutes to go, though, as we were on a bit of a replay. Let's just recap the fields. There's the three-car breakaway at the very front. So Sven Hasse. Christopher Lollum and Jamie Fluke have been able to break away in their little three-car train. A little bit further down the road, there's another three-car train for fourth place. That's Montoro, Melchers, and uh, Ozzy Dirim there, the 12, the 19, and the, the number eight. So it's the battle of the uh, trios at the very front, and the sort of more established train is from P7 and back 
behind Govan Keeney involving a few more players. Move uh, is uh, Valero down the inside. Wow, there was a nose towards the inside. There was no sting in the tail, though, uh, whatsoever. Uh, but uh, doing a good job in the 4 GT so far uh, in this one. It's, uh, again, a, a, a not a very popular car. Some say for very, very good reason. Uh, but somehow Valero's, Valero's been able to still make it work here uh, in this race and uh, get up into P8. Let's see how far uh, he is able to get up through the field. Of course, we are still... Uh, sort of getting towards the uh, middle of the first stint here, uh, so we won't see too much on-track action going on, although you see these looks of the inside and uh, some swaps of opposition, it's, um, it's, it's, it's slightly more tactical than an all-out fight uh, between these cars for the moment. They want to find themselves the right place in their train when they're not going so slowly, losing time. Uh, but, uh, it's, uh, but they also get the ample opportunity to get those fuel numbers in the right place. Yeah, you know, because he's had holding on with that 4GT. Yeah, Gael is doing a very great job of holding on with that 4GT. And, you know, uh, viewers, if you don't know the story behind the 4GT GT3 is, um, if you would go on Google and try to find a real-world 4GT GT3, you obviously wouldn't find one because it, it's one of those cars that are racing tricked about. You know, it's the early days of iRacing where we got introduced to that 4GT. And basically what they did is they created their own version of the 4GT GT2, which was racing in real life, and basically spec'd it down how it would be spec'd down in real life. And that's why we have this beautiful car still running. And, you know, it still has its advantages. It has that incredible torque out of slow corners because it is just pure muscle car underneath that hood so um, it still can hold its own ground very nicely and i'm really intrigued to see how gael is able to hold on with this 4gt in the next 27 minutes because i wonder a little bit how tireware will treat this car especially through all of these high speed corners that lamar throws it so we, we can see the back end of that Ford GT through the windscreen of Gordon Much in his BMW M4 GT3. Of course, uh, the sort of second most popular car uh, here today, and uh, certainly the second most performant uh, right now because it is a leading uh, sort of quartet of Lamborghini Huracans at the very front right now. But uh, uh, maybe there's ample opportunity later on in this race for these BMWs to show what they are made of. But uh, it, it's all a, a little bit more of a relaxed affair, affair right now, Stefan, given this is kind of what we usually see in these races. Uh, you know, <laughs> like I said, more so in the, in the bot than we've seen at other tracks this season is this first opening portion of the race just being, okay, just get the fuel, just fuel safe, blah, blah, blah. If you're out of position, then maybe you're looking for track position, trying to get those overtakes done. But if you're not and you're round about where you should be, you just kind of don't want to take any risks now between well between now and when you do have to come down in for that fuel to the end of the race no tires of course these tires well they're not even going to do a full stint uh, a, 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 well a full fuel stint of uh, an endurance race here so there's no point to change them i do have to explain things like that sometimes because not all of our viewers will be very familiar with uh, with uh, the vrs gt sprint series let alone i racing so it is with uh, it is worth explaining that from time to time i know you veterans out there will know what, what everything's about but uh, some people tuning in for the first time and do need to know that information so no tires in the one and only scheduled stop that they have to do it will lose you more time than it can you. yeah uh, most definitely you know um while you have been explaining to our viewers what this series is all about i've been watching closely to the gap uh, between Kini and Olas, uh, they're in sixth place, and I have to say, Govan Kini is actually closing down this gap, and he's bringing, as you can see, a train of another five cars right behind him to the battle for fourth place. So, um, if Kini is able to continue on with this pace, especially with Yuri Castro bump drafting him down uh, Uno Dia and now also down this straight. Um, yeah, this could still be a closing gap here for these guys to still be able to maybe ransack them a fourth place somehow out of the grasp of the three guys up ahead. Yeah, and uh, well, 
what you said about Kidi is exactly right, especially as he's just getting closer and closer and closer in terms of feeling the effects of the drop off the number eight BMW at the tail end of the train directly ahead of them. So, you know, the closer he gets, the worse it becomes for the number eight car, that's for certain, because all of a sudden they'll have this whole bunch of cars uh, locked onto the back of them. If not feeling incredibly threatened given the early stages of the race but certainly a cause for concern with 25 minutes left to go for the early stoppers if we get any they'll be coming down in around about halfway um, so about 20 minutes to go but expect uh, drivers to continue to try and push out that first in as much as possible going as deep into the second half uh, as they can yeah, you think think of a sprint race here at Le Mans just like a normal NASCAR race at Talladega. Nobody's going to pit early because everybody's going to want that draft. Uh, so, yeah, we're not going to see anybody trying to pit early. We're going to see a flop of cars all of a sudden diving to pit lane. Um, and Hassa gets slow down. Hassa's lost the race lead coming out of the four chicanes. I mean, it's a little convenient for him because he can feel safe now for the final bit of the uh, of the first stint. But let's uh, uh, let's have a look. He might have gotten one right on the right hander here. Yeah, yeah oh, it might yeah. have been. He's diving over to the right side. Yeah, so that releases Christopher Lullum and Jamie Flew. They get P1 and P2 respectively. Has uh, falling back into P3, still um, involved with that trio, so he's, he's not dropped off the back of that uh, uh, of that pairing whatsoever uh, as they head down the Mulsanne. But uh, yeah, this ca this ironically, you know, you would have thought a, a slowdown penalty actually punishes you, but in this case, it actually kind of helps him because now he's not using like a million times more fuel at the very front of the pack than he uh, than he was. So now you can slot in behind and maybe make that deficit in the stop. Just that little bit better. Of course, it's still not going to be ideal, but every little helps. Yeah, every little helps. And you're saving so much fuel at Le Mans if you're sitting behind a two-car draft. It's a crowd ball. So Sven Haas might as well um, get everything back right now that he lost by driving up in front. And as you can see in the background of your shot, that gap, it's pretty much closed already between Kini and uh, your sixth place driver because the gap is a second, but this is where the draft gets highly effective. Kini is feeling the draft up in front, so he can pretty much relax now. Doesn't have to push 145%. Uh, you know Kini, so he will still push 150%. Um, but yeah, it is a little bit better for him the situation right now because he knows that by the end of this stint, at the latest, he will be up close to these guys on the front. I, I like your choice of percentage values there, Stefan. <laughs> it was say, I heard someone say pushing 145%. It's like, it seems oddly specific there. Uh, but uh, you are right, though. Uh, for for Keeney, he is certainly one of the more aggressive drivers uh, that we see uh, on iRacing. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what his, what his choices are when he locks onto the back of that number eight machine as uh, it's getting down towards the second now between P6 and 7. Uh, so that will happen perhaps a little bit sooner than you think. There's the uh, front uh, handful of cars uh, heading their way towards the kink and into Indianapolis now. Still a handful of laps away before we'll see the majority of the field come, uh, head their way down in towards pit lane. Uh, so it, it's still a lot of setup going on at this stage. A lot of uh, making sure that they can come down when they want to. Um, but uh, but yeah, this is the calm before the storm. It's been every race so far, but I'll say it yeah. again. <laughs> yeah, we, I think we have said this for the for probably 30th time this season that this is the calm before the storm of the pit cycle. And I mean, it is just that it was a little bit of a more draft heavier track. Uh, rotation that we had this season but that doesn't mean that that's necessarily bad because you still have great fighting in those draft trains it just means that uh, it always is going to get shaken up in the pit stops and at least we're going to have even more aggressive stuff at the back end of the race because all of a sudden the guy who was leading all the race is in third place and that's an early pit stop from Sven Hase that is highly interesting because I don't think that's the right thing 
Well, he was at the very front of the field since the very start, so he would have had the highest fuel consumption of everyone. Yeah, but still, it is early. It's a very early pit stop. Uh, it, it, you are right. So uh, we, we were expecting it to be earlier than the rest of them, but not, maybe not this year for Sven Hassan. He is the only one on pit lane this time around. What's the plan? Is he spotted a pack that he can fall into once he comes off? No, no, no. Here, no. No? no, no, not even close. The, the, the pit transition time is so long at Le Mans because it's such a, such a slow and long pit lane that has, has no chance of getting out anywhere close to anyone as he just leaves pit lane. Next car up ahead is what Yoni Takanen Takanen is about 10 seconds up the road and yeah, he's now literally the ca last car running. Yeah, you're right. Eight seconds behind Tankinen in P28. So, yeah, interesting one for Sven Hasse. Not, not entirely, uh, entirely sure of the situation. It was pretty early, or, or very early, uh, to come down in. As uh, you know, there have been other cars that have been at front of trains, and, and they have decided to come down in just yet. So maybe. Uh, has to wanting to run on his own for a little bit, but which doesn't make a whole lot of sense on face value because you would have thought, okay, running in the pack, you're, you're going to be running a little bit faster. But we'll see how it works out if it works out for Sven Hasse. But for now, the front two, Lollum and Fluke, bump draft city down the Molsan. Jamie Fluke tucked in behind that fellow Lamborghini, still maintaining that three second gap over Montero. Yeah, so for Sven Haas, the stakes are high. If it works out, he can still be with these two guys in first and second place. But it really doesn't work out. He can drop as far back as outside of the top 10. That's how high the stakes are for him. So it's a very particular, a peculiar move uh, that Sven Haas decided to do there. Uh, but obviously, if it works out, it's been one of the greatest strategy calls that we have seen this season. I just don't think it's going to work out for him. But fingers crossed if you're a Sven Hase fan, because, well, he is Sven Hase. All on his own at the moment, all by myself. There's a song about that, which I won't sing because we've got copyright strikes. But uh, <laughs> here's the, uh, the mid pack, uh, around about P20 here. So we're, we're seeing uh, Gianni Vecchio lead this train around he's got up to p18 from roughly the back of the field so um, continuing to gain those positions for gianni but uh, he's got about nine and a half thousand i rating so even if he finishes there he's probably oh it. so as uh, well squeezing through on the inside goes pretty much everyone on uh, gabby montero there as uh, montero now having to deal with cars behind wanting to try and squeeze their way through on him and then another position being lost to cast up this time around so not exactly sure what triggered all of that, but uh, either way, that's uh, a good couple of passes in the same couple of court in the same couple of quarters by those drivers trying to get opportun opportunistic and get themselves the track position for the uh, well, the one and only stop coming up. Yeah, for Gary Montoro, it, it was a bad exit out of Molsan Con that triggered all of that. Was leading the train coming out of Molsan? Well, now at the back of the train at least means that for the last few centimeters of this stint, uh, Gavi can save a little bit of him. Seems to be the case, so let's see any takers this time around. There's the front two. Staying out, of course, uh, there is uh, Andre Melchers. What does he do? Someone uh, very much commits to the pit lane there, uh, as it was Govan Kini. So, oh, careful, keep it within the white lines, please. Get it slowed down. And, well, on pit lane is oh. Govan Kini. Does anyone join him? Yes. Morris Luna, Luna, yes. Yeah. But um, he did drive over the white lines on pit entry. I'm not 100% sure how pit entry works at Le Mans. Um, I think the entry is still fine until you reach the cones. So I think Luna are quite lucky that he was yet considered on pit entry. Uh, another couple of takers. We have Jax, no, ja not Jax Hedrick in. It's uh, Gianni Vecchio. Uh, we also have uh, Luke McE uh, McEwen also come down in Takanen. for their scheduled stop. Tagnan, yeah, absolutely, is also in as well. Looking back towards the uh, front. Oh, Luke. I think Fluke's got to slow down. Oh, no, no, Fluke had a spin. A oh, spin? Yeah, what? Ted Rouge. Fluke had a spin. I think. Yeah, he did. 
punched the grass on entry. Away she goes. Great save though. I have to say that, but that's a lot of time lost and that probably also means Jamie Fluke not going to be a contender for the win anymore. Oh, that's tragic. He, he was always there or thereabouts in that leading trio, but I get the feeling now that it's going to be, well, Christopher Lullum that holds all the cars. We, we're yet to see how the, um, how the strategy works out for Sven Hasse. But Lola must be <laughs> laughing at that because uh, it's given him one of the better opportunities to go ahead and go win this race now. 15 minutes left to go. Uh, we've had about a, uh, less than a quarter of the field come down in uh, for, their, for, for their own stop. But I get the feeling this time by probably a lot more. Yeah, I think either this or next lap we're going to see pretty much everybody jump in, obviously fuel consumption rather high at Le Mans. Long track and also uh, long bits of just flat are driving and that obviously consumes quite a lot of fuel. So uh, should be next two laps that we see the rest of the field come in. Maybe people were able to save another lap and that means that they're going to be able to drive three laps. But apart from that, I don't think uh, we're going to see too many more. Love them. I'm pretty much expecting our leader right now to come into pit lane this lap just because after Sven Hase retiring lead to him he was the guy leading as we have a fight too wide into Indianapolis. And it's Melchers keeping himself ahead in that second place over the same default livery in the number eight car behind. But uh, you have to expect these cars down on towards pit lane if not this lap, well, if people can stretch it to the next lap, that would be beneficial. But uh, Lullum at the very front, we're running on his own now, since uh, Jamie Fluke had that spin. Very uncharacteristic of Jamie to be doing that. But uh, uh, I thought it was a slowdown penalty coming out of Tetra Rouge. I just pushed it a little bit wide, but no. Spin, but uh, Lullum now would have thought in the best opportunity to win this race, depending, uh, uh, unless Sven Haas has been driving a bat out of hell uh, on his own. <laughs> Uh, after that early start, which uh, I doubt he's able to go faster than uh, packs of cars like this, but we will have to see. 13 minutes left to go. Let's see how many dive their way down on towards pit lane this time around, shall we? Well, Lollum, our race leader, coming down in now. So is Melchers, and, well, so is pretty much everyone. There we go. This is the time where everyone wants to come down in and get themselves at their stops done. It's a very, very busy pit entry, and uh, well, Mucho oh. just ran into the back of Montoro there. Yeah, and I think Gordon Much was a little bit too much to the left side, and thus outside of pit entry. Might have to look at that again, but I think his car was fully over the wide line, and that's never a good sign. So, big old pit party. I'm seeing no one remaining out there for another lap. So, uh, everyone in, everyone in. Uh, it's kind of hard to, spit your, uh, to spot your braking uh, or rather your pit box here in this situation as you just try and have to try and uh, figure that out and uh, uh, hopefully you're able to spot your, your lollipop, lollipop person. There's Christopher Lollop heading his way out now in the race lead at the moment. Of course, uh, it all depends on where he comes out in relation to Sven Hasse and he's comfortably ahead of Sven Hasse. Maybe not as comfortably yeah. as we would have thought. Hass is still inside two seconds behind. So if he puts together a good couple of laps here, he can certainly establish himself in the slipstream of the race leader. So it's not over yet for Hasse. Yeah, this is exactly what I said. Hasse was doing a 354.094, but his outlap was that good of Sven Hass because he didn't have to draft. So uh, that pretty much decided this for right. Now, obviously, two seconds, he can still close that in. I think he has the faster car over Chris, Chris Lulham right now. But obviously, if he's going to overtake and when he's going to overtake, uh, those are quite different questions as well. Pretty much, though, on the other hand, he did serve a uh, stop and hold penalty because he did very much cross the white line on pit entry. Something that works out in the favor of Hasse here as well is the fact that Andre Melchers is about a second behind him. You would have thought, well, someone being close behind you, that's not a benefit. Well, Melchers potentially just get himself stuck up right behind Hasse, pushing him along, bump draft him up to the race lead, right? Do you want that, though? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a driver. If you're Andre uh, Melcher, do you really want to have Sven Hase in a fight? 
<laughs> I, I'm, I'm wait, not wait, wait. sure. Uh, if if, if that is something you want to have, just because of <laughs> you know that Sven Hase will take any opportunity that he seems uh, that he deems to be a good opportunity. Uh, so uh, Sven Hase can make quick, decisive moves that you might not expect. Um, but obviously, Andre Melcher said it would also mean that he'd be able to get up to first place himself. But that's also solidifying his third place over Yuri Karstop right now, who is himself 2.2 seconds behind, who brings a whole swarm of cars behind him as well. So uh, right now, I think Andre Melcher, he has no other choice than to work together with Sven Hase to get himself up to the front secure at least a podium for him and in hope that maybe he can snack something away from these two up ahead. It's very diplomatic of you, Stefan. There we go. Um, as, uh, these guys, like you said, will have to work together somewhat to try and uh, make sure Lola is caught before the end of the race. Meanwhile, Battle for P4 going on behind between uh, uh, Osil Dirim versus uh, Yuri, uh, uh, Yuri Kastorp here. Yuri Kastorp in the Audi, just in uh, remaining in fifth place for now. But uh, yeah, this this might be one of those other potential flashpoints in this race as well. We might get a battle for the race lead. We also might get a battle for P4 and back. And it has a lot of participants, definitely. Let's just say that. Lots of drivers looking for that fourth place finish. And well, if that was le the leading three cars, slow each other down in the final two laps of this one, then maybe they might be looking for a little bit more. But that's conjecturing a little bit too much here. Still got eight and a half minutes left to go. Still a lot of things can happen between now and the check and flag. They usually do, Stefan. Yeah, they usually do. And you know, the good thing is um, with Osil Dirim uh, still being in third place, he is, I don't think, faster than Castorp right now. So um, the two guys of Hase and Melkers are gaining time on him. The gap has opened up by three tenths of this past lap. So that's good news. Oh, Sven Haas nearly has to spin through the four G cane. And another one here spin through the Rash Rakremont. So really not the greatest move here by Haas. And oh, Melkas actually worked together. He knows he is the yeah. slower car. So gives him the bump draft and just says, go ahead. You can have that fight. I don't want to have any of that. Through that entire sequence, though, they lost about half a second uh, to Lollum. And at this late stage, this isn't, it's not really half a second that you can afford to lose uh, to your opponent. So, uh, I mean, if it's around about that gap at the very end, we'll know what moment kind of ruined it. But for now, heading their way up towards Tetra Rouge, make sure you get that run onto the Molsan. Um, careful with the slowdown on the exit of that corner as well but uh, what does Andre Melcher then decide to do does he think the race win is still possible for this position I would err on the side of probably but it requires a bit of effort and a bit of teamwork between the two drivers Hassa and Melchers not just does he stick it up and uh, get the bump drafting going here no, nope, he's just going to back out of things he's not confident to, at that speed at that closing speed to actually make oh, contact Keen in back. the background though Kini makes up two positions. I'm sorry, Corey, but <laughs> just <laughs> no care in the world. Drafts past two cars to make himself the leader of the third train. <laughs> we'll, we'll take a bit of a look at it. There's it from up above, down in towards the uh, in towards the braking zone for the first chicane of the San. And I mean that that's a uh, well, cleanly done. I was going to say vintage Gilbankini yeah. move, but it, it's uh, it's not vintage Gilbankini move because he actually made it. So there we go. Let's send, <laughs> let's send back to the live pictures and not insult drivers too much here in this one. Uh, six minutes left to go. Still close run of things between P2 and P3 as they take on the unenviable task of trying to catch uh, Chris Lollum a little bit further down the road. They've gained a little bit more time in this first, first opening to the half to the lap, so maybe things are not completely done for P2 and P3 at the moment as far as their task of trying to catch the race leader, but I think this might just have to be uh, a kind of last lap, last moment thing. I mean, right now, Chris Lollum is doing a really great job, and obviously Sven Haas's near spins through the Fortune Kane and Virage Raclement really didn't help him too much. They lost, as you said, half a second in that sequence, 
Um, and they have to be bad backpedaling right now. And right now, I don't see them closing in that gap to Lala in the last uh, remaining laps. Well, they've gained back. They've gained back their lost time from the whole Forge Chicane situation. We've got another little situation going on back here as well, um, as it's uh, Galvalero, Bruno Spengler going side by side through our Nash. Spengler losing out in that particular battle. I, I think it was someone going slow through Indianapolis that sort of triggered a little bit of uh, uh, fighting there in the mid pack, but. With uh, less than five minutes to go, this is where drivers start thinking about the track position more than uh, just sort of remaining in place and uh, being very conservative about everything. The, uh, the, the go time is now, and uh, well, hopefully we'll see some battles in these last couple of laps. Ah, uh, now I spotted why Valero is so fast in that 4GT GT3. Obviously he has the race spot stickers applied on his car, <laughs> so no wonder that one is on rails. So here comes Chris Lolland then. So he's going to come across the line with how much time to go. Yeah, it's two to go here. Yeah, four, uh, ten to go. So they're, they're doing about 3.54.55s in terms of lap time. So um, it's uh, still plenty of time left on the clock to, uh, well, get that extra lap in, shall we say, Stefan. So two to go. Hassa and Melchers will be very thankful that we have two to go instead of one because they have a little bit more time to try and get up into P1. Yeah, but Haas is six tenth only faster, uh, sorry, four tenth faster than Chris Hallam this last lap. But it obviously, if you do some quick maths in your head, four times two, that's only eight, not 1.3. Obviously, Draft plays a little bit of a role there as well. He didn't have Draft yet. He did have help from a Melkers, though, Melkers Melkers is losing him as well. Three tenths. Also, he was slower uh, than Hase. So, yeah, it's, it has a little bit of an interesting spot right now. He can't get the help from Melkers in behind. He also doesn't have the Draft help of Melkers in behind, because obviously, if a car just follows you close and doesn't push you, that also gives you a draft benefit because you're losing drag just because the wake that you carry in behind the car uh, flows over the next car and it obviously gives you coefficient, uh, better coefficient in drag. Whoa, so what's going has, oh, that's one. Rina spins out into the gravel through the first hole sand chicane, gets back on circuit, no traffic coming, that's absolutely fine, but. Uh, what happened here? Because it was a battle between Spengler and uh, the uh, 4 GT of uh, Valero here. We'll see Spengler go to the inside on the way in towards the braking zone. What caused Rina to have a little bit of a moment here? Is he going to try and follow through in the tire tracks of... Uh, yeah. Oh, and it's contact. Oh, just slight contact. Yeah, but you know what? I think if we if we jump onto the onboard of Oscar Rina, you're going to see right here that he has a little bit of a slide already going into the corner. So I think he overbraked his Lamborghini right there, and then just that little touch to unsettle the rear of the uh, Lamborghini does it all that she needed, and Arena spins around sadly in that fight. So here we go then. Two minutes to go. We still got an extra lap to get things out, to get out of the way before we crown a winner of this one. Gap between race leader and P2 is now down to a second. So Hassa now feeling the effects of the slipstream to Christopher Lollum ahead. And Mel Melchers yeah. is just uh, here ready to party and uh, try and go from P3 up into P1, I get the feeling, because he isn't, well, he's unable right now to lock onto the back of uh, Hassa down the straights, but it doesn't seem like Hassa needs their help uh, because now he's uh, gaining all of his own accord down to eight tenths of a second as they head their way through um, Arnage, so uh, I think this gap will be gobbled up quite quickly from this point forward within nine tenths. Yeah, pretty much so. So Hase quite lucky. What I wanted to say is with uh, Melchus not being right in behind and Lalham not yet having the draft from him, uh, Hase has to push more and obviously could create um, more mistakes from Hase, but uh, thankfully for him, out of his point of view, Melkers did once again catch up. He is following close again, so the drag coefficient once again goes down. Um, and Hase has an easier life uh, of catching Lalham. However, it still is over 8 tenths, and uh, Hase, he still has to push quite heavily to get to Lalham. 
and we know Lil Hem, he is good at defending, especially when it comes to the last lap, and it is also about the win. This is the place where Haas has struggled previously. Oh, he's attacking those curbs still, let me tell you that. Across the line then, to start the final lap of the final race of the season here on Friday Night Primetime, the VRS GT Sprint Series. We've got three cars that can potentially take themselves the final win of the season. Lulham, well, he has a six-tenths of a second advantage over Sven Hasse. Andre Melchers, he's been sitting in, waiting behind as that third party. Maybe, maybe he'll be able to strike on this final lap as well. They, all of them have gotten about a four second gap over P4, so that shouldn't be a threat under normal circumstances. But uh, you can see how much these guys are pushing now, trying to push the track limits to the extreme to make sure they can keep themselves, well, in the case of Lulam, ahead. But Hassa, he, he has won, he has eyes on the prize now, and now it's the Molsan time. Yeah, so through Coupe d'Antares, they go for the final time down the famous Unodia, straight past the Unodia Café. That is the yellow house on the left right here. Um, yeah, Sven Hase has caught him. So oh, Lulham even <laughs> lifting off the throttle. That is... Oh, oh, the mind games are being played. Incredible. I mean, battles like this are fought, yes, on circuit, but it's fought in the head as well. And uh, Lulham knows exactly what he was doing there, trying to put Hasser off of his game. And now here comes Melchers as well. Melchers will be wanting to make some pretty quick progress disposing of these two if he wants to take uh, this race win here today. Uh, but Hasser still in the middle of that three-car train for the race lead. There's two by two behind uh, between uh, Keeney. And there's three wide potentially on the way into the chicane. Keeney holding on to that position for P4 at the moment. We'll return back to your race lead now what does Sven Hasse do into Molsan because yes if you get the pass down into Molsan that is not you safe you're still under threat through the kink and then into, and then into Indianapolis so what's the decision here for Sven Hasse Lulham going to the inside Melchers trying to maybe take a bit of a wider line here comes Sven Hasse oh he gives a bit of a shot to the back bumper Lulham's able to keep a hold of it though Lolam still leads coming out of Mulsanne Corner, but now it's the straight down towards Indianapolis that might indeed be crucial. Lolam's weaving, doing all that he can to try and break the slipstream effect. Back to those two cars behind. Hassa tucked up right behind his fellow Lamborghini. Goes to drive oh. his left hand side. They almost make contact coming down the straight here. In towards the kink then. Too wide. Hassa is ahead. Hassa in the race lead, but this is not done. Lullum can come back at him. What does Melchers do as well as they head their way in towards, uh, uh, oh, in towards Ardage? Oh, Lullum's a little bit slow coming through there. There's another straight bit of road, though. Another slipstream opportunity for Lullum, maybe to get things done in towards the Porsche Kiz. It's a very, very brave attempt if he goes for it. But Hassa holds all the cars right now. We were questioning the, the early stop from Hassa, but it has worked a treat. It oh, gets him goes. ahead of Lullum. There's a look to the inside for Lulham. No opportunity there, though. Melcher's getting close behind as well. Hassa trying to stretch the gap in the race lead. What a race we're having in the final lap of the season here in the VRS GT Sprint Series. Lulham still second place after losing this race lead on the final lap. Is there going to be a lunge down in towards the Forge Chicanes? That's the question that you need to be asking. It's the final lap. Anything can happen. But maybe Lulham's a little bit too far behind as now Melchers goes to the dive. Melchers, oh, he completely messes up. So does Lulham. But the driver that didn't mess up today, even though we thought he did, with the early stop is Sven Hasse. He takes the race win here at Le Mans as uh, Lullum and Melchers uh, head their way across the line. Keeney and Castorp, I believe you might have mentioned it, they've had an incident, maybe also fuel related. Yeah, Lullum was out of fuel. Keeney, I think, was out of fuel as well. Something like that. Really weird incidents here in the last few laps. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll have to all dissect that in the replay though. Yeah, so here's the uh, the battle a bit further back. Involving Jamie Fluke as well. Jamie Fluke heading down the inside, or at least attempting to go down the inside of Keeney there. Keeney carries lots of speed, trying to make a move on the 15 Audi into the final uh, turn. 
Well, I, I mentioned the vintage Keeney moment earlier. I think that was the one confirmed as uh, you completely sense it uh, on that Audi. And yeah, that's that's what happens sometimes. You know, yeah, that's a big yikes. But uh, across the line they come. Keeney still P12 though. A uh, couple of drivers are having fuel issues across their line, sputtering. But what what an end though <laughs> in the in the lead. Um, Sven Hasse able to get things done on the final lap. You know, we, we, we doubted that early stop and perhaps it was helped a little bit by the fact that Fluke had that spin and, and was also not able to challenge because he would have been a strong contender if that spin didn't happen. But either way, the only result that matters is the one at the end of the race and Sven Hasse has been able to get it. Yeah, Sven Haase has been able to get it. And you know, Chris Lulham, he nearly lost that second place as well because he started to run out of fuel out of the Corvette chicane uh, and through Marcel Blanche. So really lucky for Lulham that he was able to get away with that second place as well. Here's a look at the results then. For the final race of the season here at Le Mans for the VRS GT Sprint Series, Sven Haase. P1 by 1.7 seconds over Christopher Lullum. Of course, uh, like you said, it was a close run between Lullum and Melchers to the line, uh, separated by not too much. Melchers third place. Uh, Ozil Dirim in P4. He comes home there. Uh, Fluke recovering up into P5 after the spin before uh, the uh, first handful of, well, the, the first and only stops as uh, Montero in P6. Valero P7 in the 4GT. 4GT P7. How about that? Foreign Labigra in P8 with uh, Elias Raika in P9 and Bruno Spengler rounding out the top 10 here today. Middle of the field, you got Castorp in P11, Cuny P12, Lona P13, Kolozzi in P14, uh, Oscar Irina after a spin in P15 with Nunes in P16. Gianni Vecchio recovers from, well, not selling a time in qualifying. He finishes in P17, McEwen in P18, uh, Gangon Renault in P19, and uh, Virga in P20. Then those at the back of the field, uh, Malenek, Volkovic, Veyron, Chico, uh, Godino, Locatello, Sedgwick, Takanen, Much, and uh, Masajewski, those latter two names uh, are the only retirements over the course of this race here today. Well, that just about wraps, thing, wraps things up. Not for, not just from the uh, the fantastic circuit of the Circuit de la Salle here at Le Mans, but also the... Race Spot TV Friday primetime season for the VRS GT Sprint Series. We've had uh, a, a fantastic a couple of races uh, uh, over the course of this season. And, uh, well, we will keep it a mystery as to which series we're going to cover for next season of Race Spot TV Friday primetime. You'll know about that some point towards the end of week 13 here, Stefan. Stefan, if you have uh, any preferred series, well mention it right now because uh, we could be broadcasting it boy that's a that's a big task on the stand i mean i always love my gt3 racing but you know i always fancy a little bit of imsa imsa well we've done imsa recently um that well was that was last challenge. season's yeah oh well Okay, you didn't specify which one. So there we go. That's the excuse I'll use. But the IMSA Sports Car Series, um, potentially. Uh, we will have to wait and see. But uh, at least from us, from myself, uh, I'm Conor Maddock, and of course, uh, uh, Stefan Schlacker. That's going to be all that we have time for here in the VRS GT Sprint Series. Uh, it's been a fantastic season. It's been a, a, a great privilege uh, to be taking part in this one. Uh, at, at least for the sort of final two thirds of the race for me uh, here, uh, final two thirds of the season for me on commentary. But uh, Stefan's been here since the very, very start. We thank you very much for watching this season. And well, we'll have a bit of a break at week 13 uh, while iRacing can get their updates done. And we'll be back with another season of Race Spot TV Friday primetime in two weeks' time with a yet unannounced series. We'll see you then. <laughs>